Hello, I think we're working. I hope we're working. 16 minutes late, but um, hopefully this is working and hopefully we can be ready to go here. Praise God. You know, I've told you all many times that I hate Facebook, right? That it is so stupid. I think the only thing dumber than Facebook is Andrew Cuomo, right? Anyway, so we will, uh, we will keep going. Ah, that guy's an idiot, right? Anyway, yeah, praise God. <laughs> anyway, praise God. Glad to be here. And guess what? It's Mother's Day. And so we want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful moms out there. And I'm sorry that we can't be here together to celebrate with you all, but uh, we trust and we pray that you are having a wonderful Mother's Day, and uh, praise God for all of you. I've been very blessed with a wonderful mom and a wonderful mother-in-law now also, and we thank God for good moms, and again, we wish we could be here together, but next week we will be. And that's the announcement, the other announcement I want to make here uh, this morning is that next Sunday, May 17th, so one week from today, we will be here. We will be having church together. And uh, regardless of what anyone else is doing, we are going to be here. I think that this is way past time. You know, we thought about starting in the beginning of May. We decided to wait until after their little May 15th date, but we are going to be here next Sunday, Lord willing. We're going to have church. We would love to have you come, and we trust that everyone will take whatever proper precautions they feel necessary, and if that means staying home, then that's fine. If that means coming and sitting in a corner somewhere away from people, that's fine, but, but we do trust that Everyone will take the proper precautions that they believe are right for them. and But we know it is right for us to start to have church. And I really hope and pray that, that all churches start. I think the time to continue to listen to our wicked leaders is ended, for sure. It is definitely ended. I think that what is going on right now... And again, wicked leaders telling churches not to meet, telling businesses not to open. That is un-American. It is unconstitutional. It is unbiblical. We are well within our constitutional rights. We are well within our biblical rights to disregard wicked leadership. And that's what we're going to do regardless of what they say. They have no, no power to stop us from meeting. And I would think, honestly, any Christian at this point who would say that we're called to continue to listen to our government, I would say that is not Christian, that is cowardly. And I don't think we're called to listen to wicked leaders. I know we're not. And that is what we have. I said earlier that the only thing stupider than Facebook is Governor Andrew Cuomo, and it is absolutely uh, true. And so I would love for him to be watching this, honestly. I, I, I wish he would. He won't, of course, but I wish he would. But anyway, we are going to meet. We are going to have church. We are going to stand strong for God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to pray that many join us in that. Again, the time to stand is now. So this will be the last Sunday that we... Now look, we're going to keep streaming, again, as long as Facebook isn't dumb, we're going to keep streaming our services. So if you want to stay home, if, you, if that's what is right for you, we will still be here to do this for you, and, and, and we plan on doing this forever, Lord willing, now. But starting next Sunday, we will be in church. We will absolutely be in church and we are excited to be in church together. And again, at this point, I think it is wrong to not be in church. And I would tell any pastor that. I would tell any believer that. Um, again, if you're older, if you're sick, that's one thing. But for the churches to continue to listen to this nonsense, which is unbiblical, it's unscientific, it's going against everything that we're seeing in the data right now. 
um, then we, we're not going to listen to that anymore. We're going to do what we're going to do, and God is going to bless us for doing what we are going to do here. And we praise God for that. And so anyway, so we will be here, and if your church is going to not have church, if they're going to do the cowardly thing, I would encourage you to come to our church. Because we're going to be here, we're going to be standing bold for the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of wickedness, regardless of what anyone else does. And so we'd love to have you join us, for sure. Love to have you join us. But right now, we are glad to have you with us today. We're glad that this is finally working today. And I hope it is. I hope it sounds okay. I hope it's working okay. And again, we're just going to do the best we can by God's grace. And so this morning, we're going to finish this incredible chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, all about faith. This chapter that encourages us to grow in our faith, encourages us to endure in our faith. We understand, and we've been saying this, that our lives are not perfect. Our faith is not perfect. But our Savior and our Lord is absolutely perfect 100% of the time. And so in His power and in His grace, we move forward. We keep going. And that's what we're going to do by the grace and power of God. And especially in the days in which we're living, we must take God at His word. We must move forward in faith. And we praise God that we can. And so right now, we're going to read our passage for this morning. So I would ask you to stand, if you could, for the reading of God's Word, wherever you are. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and in dens, and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for all of our wonderful mothers on this Mother's Day. We ask you to bless each one as only you can. And we ask you to empower us now, empower me to preach the word, empower all of us to receive the word, bless this time, be glorified by this time, and change us through this time. And so we thank you, Lord, and of course we pray all this now, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well praise God, and again, glad to be here as we finish up Hebrews chapter 11. The just shall live by faith. We understand that. The just shall live by faith. And that's really what Hebrews 11 is all about. And that's what we want to be all about in our lives here at Lord of the Harvest Church and in the days that we're living in. We need to live by faith. We've seen a lot in these first 31 verses over the past three weeks. And now, verse 32, the writer says, and what shall I more say? Because there's so much else he could say. There's so much else he would want to say. There's so many others that he could get into and talk about who'd show incredible faith. 
And he mentioned just a few here in verse 32. And this list is by no means exhaustive, as we know. But he says the time would fail him to talk of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, men of faith, and yet flawed men. And I think that's one of the things that the writer is trying to get us to realize. Remember back in verse 31, who is in the great hall of faith? The harlot Rahab. The harlot Rahab. And that's where we, where we left off last week. We talked about her. The fact that the harlot Rahab is in the hall of faith, in the line of Christ. Praise God. How gracious is our God. How amazing is our God that he takes flawed, sinful people and uses them mightily for his glory. Well, here in verse 32, really, we have a list of flawed, sinful people and people that we would not expect to be here. People that no one would expect much from. But that's who our God is. He takes those that no one else expects much from, takes those that are flawed and sinful, and he uses them mightily for his glory. You think of a guy like Gideon. Gideon was the least in his family, and his family was poor in his tribe. He came from a lowly family, and he was the lowliest of that family. He was a coward. And yet God used him mightily. God used him mightily. Barak, he wasn't exactly the picture of valor and courage. He would not go to fight the Canaanites unless Deborah went with him. And yet here he is in the hall of faith. Samson. Samson was a selfish, immature, lustful man. And yet, here he is in the hall of faith. God still used him mightily, praise God. Jephthah. Jephthah was the son of a harlot, cast out of his family by his brethren. Later in life, he made a tragic vow that greatly affected his daughter. And yet, God used him mightily to defeat the Ammonites. Here he is in the hall of faith. How about David? Yes, David, the great king of Israel, right? Praise God, we all love David, and rightfully so. David was the youngest of eight sons. And when you read what 1 Samuel says, it's pretty evident his family did not really think much of him. No one really thought he would amount to all that much. The youngest of eight sons. A great sinner, by the way, as we know. A man full of lust. A man full of pride. A man full of fear at times. A man who murdered another man. A man who was not a very good father. We see all of this in David's life. And yet he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who trusted God. He became a great prophet, a great king, and a man who loved God tremendously and was used by God tremendously. Not a perfect man, though. Samuel's in here, and we read a lot of great things about Samuel, but we also see that his sons were wicked, so he probably wasn't the best father either. What's the point? The point is there are no men or women that are naturally good. The point is there are no perfect people, and thank God then that God uses imperfect people. You see, God uses what he has to work with. God does not have any perfect people to work with. If God can use these men, and of course the prophets are here in verse 32, and when you read about the prophets, again, great men, but men who were scared at times, men who did not would never be thought of as great men who God would use based on their upbringing and where they were from. Again, imperfect, flawed, sinful men. That is who God has to work with. And that is who God does work with. He uses flawed, imperfect, sinful men by His grace and for His glory. He uses the harlot Rahab. And he uses the coward, lowly Gideon. And he uses sinful David. 
and selfish, immature Samson, and he uses you and me as well, and praise God that he does. Praise God that he does, and he does it by his grace, through the faith that we have and that he allows us to have. And so praise God for that. So look at what these men did. Look at what they did. Verse 33. Who through faith, again, all of this, everything in this chapter, through faith. By faith. By the power of God, through the faith of man, who through faith subdued kingdoms. They subdued kingdoms. And they did. Men like David. Men like these different judges. Men like Joshua. They did that. They subdued kingdoms. They defeated kingdoms. They conquered enemies. Praise God. They wrought righteousness or brought righteousness. That's what the prophets did. They spoke the word of God. That's what the judges did. That's what these good kings did. Not all the kings were good. Many were not. But the good ones, they brought righteousness to the kingdom. We're called to do the same thing today. We're called to bring righteousness to where we are. We're called to speak the truth. And by the grace and power of God, we can. So they subdued kingdoms. They brought righteousness. They obtained promises. They obtained promises. And we're going to see here a little bit later. They did not obtain in their life the ultimate promise of Jesus. We can look back on Christ, praise God. They had to look forward to Christ. It was harder for them than it is for us. A lot harder for them. But they did obtain promises. Just as we have obtained promises. Praise God. They stopped the mouths of lions. And I'm sure right off the top of your head, you think of Daniel there, right? Praise God for good old Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, thrown into the lion's den, and the lion's mouths were stopped miraculously. But what about David? He talks about how he defeated the lion in 1 Samuel 17. What about Samson, who killed the lion in Judges 14? It's, it's pretty hard to kill a lion with your bare hands. And that's what these men were able to do, defeat lions. In Daniel's case, God miraculously stopping the mouths of lions. Praise God. So all these great things that happened through faith, all these great things these men did through faith, through the power of God's grace, and through the faith God had given them. Praise God. We, by the grace of God, moving forward in faith, will do great things as well. We will. And we talked about this, I think, last time, maybe the time before, that many of the things we do in faith are not the so-called great things. They're the little things. But remember, great things are only a series of little things. Nothing great ever happens without a series of small things happening first. Great things are made up of small things. Praise God for that. So we move forward in faith. We move forward in faith. Look at verse 34. Quench the violence of fire. We think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Daniel's three friends there in Daniel chapter 3 who refused to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. And God spared them in that fire. Again, how appropriate is that for us today? As we were just saying earlier, we as believers need to refuse to bow to the wicked image of our leaders when they're trying to make us not have church and make us not do things that we're supposed to do. We know this has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with health. It has nothing to do with concern for people. It's wickedness. We know that. And how do we know that? Because liquor stores and abortion clinics are considered essential. And yet churches and small businesses are not. That's how we know this is wicked. Our governor does not care for the people of this state any more than Nebuchadnezzar would care for them. Before his salvation. He cares about his own wicked communist agenda. Just like the entire Democratic Party today. And we're going to stand against that. And we're going to stand for God's word in faith. And we're going to have church. And we're going to move forward and see how God blesses us. Praise God. And so we're going to keep going in faith. We will quench the violence of the fire. We will be blessed as we stand on God's word. And that's what these men did, and praise God. And so they quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. How many of these men escaped the edge of the sword? How many of these men 
escaped death because of their faith in God. Because of their love for God, many of them, men like David again, men like Elijah, men like Elisha, and others, praise God for that. Praise God for that. So they quench the violence of fire. They escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness were made strong. What does the Apostle Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He ends up saying, I praise God for the times that I am weak because I understand that in those times God's grace is made perfect. God's strength is made perfect. That God's grace is sufficient for me. And when I am weak, then I am strong. Now listen, and God reminds me of this in my own life. When we are strong, then we're actually weak. When we are strong in ourselves, when we get into our own flesh, and when we think we're powerful enough, we're smart enough, we're strong enough, then we're going to fail. But when we rely on God's strength, when we are weak in ourselves, when we understand that it is God's power and God's wisdom and God's might, then we are going to succeed. Praise God. And so, as the Bible says, out of weakness were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight, and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens. These were men that God used, and often he even used them to defeat enemies. He made them strong. David talks about how God taught his hands to war. And that's a very real part of who God is. And I've said this many times, and I know many of you agree, that today we have turned God into some wuss. We don't think of God as the warring king that he is anymore. But that is a very real, very powerful, very true part of who God is. He hates evil. He is a just God. He teaches our hands to war. Many of the great generals and military men in history were God-fearing as well. They understood that God taught them to war as well. And God is the one that gave them the victory. And God is the one that will give us the victory too. So God taught their hands to war. He taught them how to fight. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1. I love that verse. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are bold as a lion. Again, how appropriate that verse is today. My dad and I were talking about this yesterday. Again, with this virus that is out there. And it is a real virus, we understand. But we also understand that the numbers are clear. Unless you are have some real sickness, some real underlying condition, or unless you're very old, you have nothing to worry about from this virus. Yet it's amazing. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. How many people are scared to death right now? And they have no reason to be. They have no reason to be. And even Christians, some are afraid, and they shouldn't be. Again, we shouldn't be. We should take care of ourselves, take our vitamins, and pray and trust in God. And God will take care of us. God will bless us. And I'm not a doctor, but honestly, I think you and I are a lot smarter than the average doctors today. Because again, like we said a few weeks ago, so-called experts always seem to know nothing. Let's just use good old-fashioned common sense, right? Good old-fashioned biblical sense, praise God. Let's walk in faith. Let's walk in faith, not in fear, but in faith, praise God. And so God will teach us to war. God will help us to be strong. Again, the wicked flee when no man pursue, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And we're going to be bold in these days in which we're living. And we need to boldly, yet graciously, but boldly stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the truth of God's word. So incredible things that these men did through faith. Verse 35, we're told women received their dead, raised to life again. And if you read in the Old Testament, you see that God used the prophet Elijah to do this. God used the prophet Elisha to do this. Great things that God did. Great things that God did through these men. Praise God. Praise God for that. God is powerful to do the miraculous. 
and our faith can only help. We've talked about this, that we don't actually need faith for God to work. God can do what he will do. In the Bible, Jesus often healed people who had no faith. We understand that God will do what he will do regardless of our faith, but faith can only help because we also see examples and circumstances in which because of faith, Jesus did things. And we know, as Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But if we do believe in him, if we diligently seek him, he will diligently reward us. And so certainly, the greater our faith, the greater God will likely work in our life. And we praise God for that. So, between verse 33 and the beginning of verse 35, all these incredible things that men did through faith. Praise God for the power of God. Praise God for all the wonderful things he does when his people believe in him. But then look at how it changes in the middle of verse 35. We read, and others were tortured. Others were tortured. And we want to say, wait a second. What do you mean others were tortured? We've been talking about all the great things done through faith. We've been talking about subduing kingdoms and escaping fire and escaping sword and people being raised from the dead. What do you mean others were tortured? How could others be tortured through faith? We have to understand there is faith for triumph. And in our faith, we will often triumph over the enemies in this world. But there is also faith for trials. There is also faith for trials. So there is faith to triumph. And there is faith to suffer. In faith, we will win great victory. And in faith, we will suffer in what looks like great defeat. Yet in the sight of God, it too is great victory. And so we must understand that we must dispel with the notion right now that just because we have faith, everything will be good all the time. Just because we have faith, bad things will not happen. Just because we have faith, just because we love Jesus, men will not harm us. Or we will never suffer defeat or suffer persecution. That is simply not true. Jesus promises us that we will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Matthew 16, verse 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, our Lord says. The cross really is a symbol of death. The cross is a symbol of death. Suffering, yes, but really ultimately a symbol of of death. So if we're going to follow our Lord, we're called to be willing to die for our Lord. Faith allows us to do that. We have faith to triumph and we have faith to suffer. And so some received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. Others were tortured. Not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. How amazing is that? How truly awesome is that kind of faith? We might say the greatest faith is the one to subdue kingdoms and to escape the fire. But I think we can make a great argument that the greatest faith is one that is not willing to accept deliverance. That it might obtain a better resurrection. It is great faith. It is taking God at his word, just as he tells us to, to do that right there. To suffer for the Lord Jesus, and to rather suffer than be delivered. And really, to rather die than be delivered. Why? Because it's a better resurrection. We might be spared the suffering in this life. We might be delivered from death. Some people were risen again from the dead. They came back from the dead, only to die again. That's not a better resurrection. That's coming back to this life, this flawed, fallen, sinful life in this wicked world. The better resurrection is to die and go be with Jesus. 
And these men and women had enough faith to know that and to believe that. And so they would rather die and go be with Jesus than to come back to this life for a little bit longer. And we have brethren all around the world today that have that kind of faith. We understand that in the church of Jesus Christ, people have always been killed. There's always been martyrs for the faith. And to this day, there are many around the world that face martyrdom and are dying and suffering for their faith. And many have this kind of faith where they would rather die than come back or spend any more time in this fallen world. As the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The Apostle Paul would rather go and be with Christ than to stay in this world. As long as he was in this world, his life would be about Christ. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And really, that's the heart of these men here. Not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Again, many have suffered. Many still suffer today for their faith in Jesus Christ. Faith to triumph and faith to suffer. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder or sawn in half. Can you imagine being sawn in half? And yet tradition tells us that's what happened to the prophet Isaiah under the hands of the wicked king Manasseh. Tradition tells us that Isaiah was martyred by being sawn in two. The same Isaiah who in chapter 6, verse 8 of the book that bears his name, said to the Lord, Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. That's the kind of faith Isaiah had. That's the kind of heart Isaiah had. That's the kind of passion Isaiah had. And God took him and God sent him and God used him mightily and he was sawn in half at the end of his life. And yet even now, he's enjoying a better resurrection. Praise God for men like Isaiah. Praise God for the faith they had. So men were stoned, men were sawn in half, and he's not the only man or woman or child to be murdered in a cruel and brutal way in this world for their faith in Jesus. To this day, some are suffering in horrible, horrible ways. We're told in the middle of verse 37, they were tempted, tested, or tempted. And look, temptation can be a great trial. There are tests that come our way that are great trials. It takes faith to get through them. It certainly takes faith to get through them. So they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, slain with the sword. Again, many, many have been martyred. Many have been persecuted for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then verse 38 says, They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And isn't it true that the Christian life is often one of wandering? We are pilgrims on this earth. What did we read a few weeks back in verse 13? That these men, these patriarchs, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Philippians 3 verse 20 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. We don't belong on this earth. This earth is not our home. Just look around and you'll see how true that is. We wander in this earth. We are often destitute, afflicted, tormented by the sin around us. 
lonely. Sometimes just knowing the truth is a very lonely and burdensome thing. We wander around because we know the truth and so few want to listen. Winston Churchill once said, the truth is heavy, therefore few care to carry it. We have this burden of truth and thank God we do. But that can be a lonely thing. Knowing and believing the truth can cause us to wander around afflicted and tormented and suffering. But I'd rather suffer in the truth than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and die and go to hell. And I think you would too. But this can be a lonely life. This can be a lonely life. A life of wandering. A life of torment and affliction. We skip something there in verse 38. Look back at it right now. In the beginning of verse 38, it's in parentheses. How great is that? Of whom the world was not worthy. What does God say about his saints? What does God say about these great men and women of faith? He says the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of them. You know, the world is blessed for the sake of God's people. We see this time and time again in Scripture. We see that even pagan men, even wicked men are blessed for the sake of righteous men. We see this in Joseph's life in the book of Genesis. We see this in Jacob's life in the book of Genesis. We see this throughout the Bible throughout history, we understand that the church blesses the world. And even though the world hates the church so often, the world would be doomed without the church. The church is a blessing to the world, which is why the world was not worthy of these men. The world was not worthy of the blessing that it got from these men. The world who persecuted these men was certainly unworthy of being blessed by these men. And so what a phenomenal statement right there in the middle of a very difficult passage. Difficult reading, especially when you think about what we may have to face one day in light of what they faced in their day. This is difficult, and yet, praise God, the world was not worthy of them. The world is not worthy of the blessing it received from them. Is the world worthy of us today? What do we love more, this world or the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the world worthy of us? Is the world worthy of us? I hope not. It's only by grace that this world is unworthy of us, but I sure hope not. I sure hope the world is not worthy of us. And now verse 39 and 40. We talk about faith for triumph, faith for trials, and how about enduring faith now? Enduring faith. And isn't that what this whole chapter has been about? The just shall live by faith. True faith is an enduring faith. True faith is a faith that perseveres, and by the grace of God, may that be us. You see, these men that we've been reading about in this great hall of faith, they look forward. We look back. All must endure. All must endure. So let's see what we're talking about here. Verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith. Let me just stop right there. What a blessing that is. Even the fact that that can be true. And we saw that back in verse 2. The elders obtained a good report, we're told, through faith. Now we're told these men obtained a good report through faith. So sometimes that good report leads to triumph. Sometimes that good report leads to trials. It always pleases God. And how wonderful to know that we can please our God. That God can look down on us and be pleased with our lives and pleased with our faith. However imperfect it is, however flawed it is, and all of these men had flawed, imperfect faith. 
They all lived flawed, imperfect lives, yet they obtained a good report through faith. And part of faith is believing what God says about His grace. Part of faith is believing what God says about His mercy and believing that even when we struggle and even when we flaw and even when our flesh gets the best of us, that we are forgiven and we are children of the King and we are saints and the beloved of the Lord and that we will win in the end. And so in the meantime, we're going to keep going now. That's a big part of faith. Taking God at his word about our salvation, about his grace, and about his mercy, praise God. So these all having obtained a good report through faith, through faith, received not the promise. Received not the promise. Oh, they obtained promises. Verse 33 says, in faith they obtained promises. They obtained many promises, just as we obtain promises as well. But they did not receive the promise of Jesus. They did not live to see Jesus come. They did not live to see Christ. So in that sense, they did not receive the promise. Now they were saved by Jesus. They were saved by his grace through their faith. But they did not actually live to see Jesus come. They received not the promise, the greatest promise. Think of Simeon in Luke chapter 2. Maybe you recall the story of Simeon, this godly man, evidently an older man, who the Lord had revealed to him that he would live to see Jesus. And when Mary and Joseph took Jesus into the temple there in Luke chapter 2, Simeon got to behold him and hold him in his arms. And he was so grateful, and he thanked God, and he said, Now I can die in peace, having beheld my Savior. What an incredible blessing. It gives me chills to even think about how that man felt. He did get to see the promise in part, but many of these saints, all of these saints here in Hebrews 11, did not live to see the promise. They did not obtain or receive the promise of Jesus coming. We have received that promise. We have received that promise. Look at verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. We need to understand, there are many advantages to being a New Testament saint, as opposed to an Old Testament saint. And the first one is this right here. We have received the promise. We get to look back on the cross. We know what happened. The Bible tells us what happened. They had to look forward to the cross. They got little bits and pieces and little glimpses in their Bible about what it would be like. But we have the whole picture now. We look back on Jesus. We look back on Jesus. What an advantage it is for us. Another great advantage. We have the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling us permanently indwelling us. They did not have that. The Holy Spirit could come and go as He pleased in the Old Testament. We see Him doing just that. That's why David had to pray in Psalm 51, Lord, take not Thy Holy Spirit from me. Because He could. Now no believer need pray that prayer. Because we permanently have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What a great advantage. And another great advantage, we have the entire completed word of God. The entire and completed word of God is ours. And so when we're all in heaven together one day with these great saints, they're not going to look at us and pity us. They're not going to be impressed by how hard we had it. We're all going to be impressed by Jesus, first of all. But if we can look back on this life, and I don't know how that's all going to work, but they would not be overly impressed with our faith. We should be impressed with their faith. The fact that without the advantages we have today, they were men and women of faith. They persevered to the end. They had faith to triumph, and they had faith to suffer. Let us never forget that God has provided a better thing for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. One day we will all be perfected together 
in heaven as the children of God. There will be no more sin. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more communist or socialist. There will be no more wickedness. There will be no more of this stuff. There will be Jesus Christ. There will be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There will be the holy angels, and there will be us as the people of God. And what a glorious day that will be. What a glorious day that will be. What a perfect day that will be when our faith is perfect. Our faith is complete. When we are glorified with our Lord. What a glorious, glorious day day. So praise God for faith. Praise God for the faith to triumph. Praise God for the faith to suffer. Praise God for faith. Praise God that we look back on Jesus. Praise God that we are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Praise God we have the finished word of God. And as we close this morning, let's look at the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. We said that this great hall of faith really begins at the end of Hebrews 10, and it really ends at the beginning of Hebrews 12. So let us close in that way now. So Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Seeing that these are the men and women who came before us. They are witnesses, not spectators. They're not looking down on us, but they are inspirations to us. This is a cloud of faithful witnesses that should inspire our lives, that should motivate our faith. So see, we have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, and weight could be good or bad. There are sinful weights we carry. There are just the normal weights of life that we carry sometimes. Let us lay those aside. Let us cast our care upon the Lord. Let us cast those weights upon the Lord. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. We all have sin. We all have sin. We all have besetting sins. We all have things that we struggle with more than maybe others struggle with. We all have them. So don't think you're the only one. We all have besetting sin. We all struggle with sin. We're called in light of this great cloud of witnesses in light of all the great men and women that have gone before us, we are called to lay aside our sin, to lay aside the weight, and to run with patience the race that is set before us. To run with patience or endurance. Endurance, and that is the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11, enduring faith. So let us lay aside the weights, let us lay aside the sin, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And notice, it's not the race that is set before someone else. Sometimes we get ourselves in great trouble because we're trying to run someone else's faith or someone else's race. We're trying to work out someone else's salvation. Jesus does not tell us to do that. Jesus tells us to run the race that is set before us. To run the race that he's given us to run. Not anyone else. So let us lay aside our sin. Not anyone else's sin. Let us lay aside our weights. Not anyone else's weights. And let us run with patience our race. Not anyone else's race. Let us run with patience our race. An interesting point about that word race is the Greek word agone, which you may have guessed, we get our English word agony. So really, what the Bible is telling us, what our Lord is literally telling us here, is that let us lay aside the weight and lay aside the sin and run with endurance the agony that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the agony that is set before us. Because it will be agonizing sometimes. It will be difficult sometimes. 
There is faith that leads to trials sometimes, as we have seen. This Christian life is an agonizing life some of the time. It's also a wonderful, joyful, peaceful, incredible life. It's eternal life, but on this earth it will be agonizing at times. And if it's not agonizing at times, then you're probably not a child of the King. But this Christian life will be agony sometimes, but we're called to run it with patience. We're called to run it with endurance, to run the agony that is set before us. How do we do this? We don't just look and find inspiration from the great saints that went before us, but we look and find inspiration from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. And that is always the answer to everything. 100% of the time, that is always the solution to the problem we're having. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, or the captain and perfecter of our faith. He's the captain of our salvation. He's the one that saves us, the one that perfects us. He even now is perfecting our faith as we follow him. So look to Jesus, the captain and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. We're called to endure. Our Lord already endured for us. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And that means he fought against it, or again, he endured it. So he endured the cross. He endured the shame. And he is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise God, and he deserves to be there. He absolutely deserves to be there. So we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy of reconciling God and man, and for the joy of returning to the glory he left, he endured the cross, he endured the shame. And now he is reaping the reward a people for himself, and glory at the right hand of God. For consider him, verse 3 now tells us, for consider him, think on him, contemplate him, think about all he went through for us, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. When we are weary, when we are tempted to quit, when we are tempted to stop, when we are tempted to turn back, we look to Jesus. We consider Jesus. We recall all that he did for us, how he endured far worse suffering than we could ever endure. He did not deserve any of it. We do deserve at least some of what we have to face. We look to Jesus. We consider him. We consider the fact that none will ever suffer more than Christ. We consider that he told us to take up our cross and follow him. And we ask ourselves the question, in light of all he did, shall his servants bear nothing? Or are we called also to bear through the suffering, to endure the pain, and to keep going. You know the answer. Of course we are. So when we are tempted to quit, when we are weary, when we want to stop, we look to Jesus, we consider Jesus, because he kept going, we keep going. We keep fighting. We keep enduring. Our faith is not perfect, but his grace is the men and women of Hebrews chapter 11 were not perfect, but God's grace was. Our lives are not perfect, but God's grace is. We keep going. We keep enduring. We keep fighting the good fight. We keep the faith. We cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. We cling to the grace of God. 
We walk by faith, not by sight, through all the ups and downs of this life, continuously looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, where we began this study, we will now end it. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So by the grace of God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, by the sufficiency of His Word, and the comfort of His mercy, May we today, as the justified children of God, live by faith. And let's pray right now that God would help us to do just that. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time. We thank you so much for your grace. And we thank you for the saving grace and for the saving faith that you have given us. And it is our prayer, it is our desire, it is our hope to endure in the faith. To endure in the faith each and every day. So help us today, Lord God. Help us tomorrow, Lord willing. Help us each and every day, in each and every circumstance, the ups and and the downs, and all of the trials, and everything that we may face. Help us to endure in faith. Help us to walk by faith, and not by sight, because the just shall live by faith. Give us grace today, Lord. Give us grace. The wicked flee when no man pursue, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. May we have that boldness, and may we have that wisdom, and that grace that we need today, especially in the days in which we are living. And of course, we pray that in these days our light would shine brighter, that your word would be proclaimed bolder, and that your Holy Spirit will work greater to lead many to yourself, that many will repent of their sins and turn to you. And so we thank you today, Lord Jesus. We thank you for these things. We thank you for your mercy and grace. And now we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise God. Again, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for bearing with us because, again, we are having troubles today with Facebook and with everything. But thank you for bearing with us. And we will continue to stream each Sunday. And I'll be doing videos each morning this week as well. Hopefully, Facebook will cooperate, of course. But Lord willing, starting next Sunday, May 17th, we will be right here having church. And so let's walk by faith and not by sight. And let's do what the Bible would have us to do, which is meet together, especially as we see the day approaching. So we would encourage you to come and to be here. And like I said, if your church is going to do the cowardly thing and not have church, we'd encourage you to come here to our church next Sunday, May 17th. And so we can't wait to do that, and we're excited to have you. And so praise God. Have a wonderful rest of your day. God bless. And now I'm going to try to figure out how to close this thing. So bear with me. All right, here we go.